mentioned in their post on the blog um, was this question, where were you on September 11th, 2001? And that's a question that's often asked. And in my case, it's not a particularly good story, but I was in, in a Dole office in, in Limerick uh, at the time. Um, and it's kind of a positive in a way, because one of the reasons why there's been such an interest in international relations and why so many people have got jobs teaching international relations, like me, I guess, is because of these events. And the focus hasn't been exclusively on terrorism, it's been on international relations, primarily because of the way in which the war on terror was um, initiated and, and orchestrated, I guess. And I suppose what I'm going to try to talk about in, in a few minutes here today is um, what this has told us about ourselves, really, and about our own system. Not about the big bad world out there where there's terrible people doing terrible things, etc., etc., but it kind of reminds me of there was a famous sort of phrase by, by Nietzsche who said that, um, I'm paraphrasing now, but he who hunts monsters would want to be sure he doesn't become a monster himself. And in the process of dealing with something which quite obviously was horrific, what have we lost? And what does it tell us about ourselves in, in that sense? And when we look at the, um, the events, it's worth kind of, you know, breaking it down into its simple component parts, really, and trying to pick out of that the aspects of the way in which the war on terror was prosecuted, which really tell us a lot about how we view the world and our national interests, let's say, and our understanding of security. And from the very beginning, we had this conception of you're either with us or against us, that there is no grey area. It's bad guys, it's good guys, it's, it's Star Wars. You know, this is, this is a battle between good and evil. And many neoconservative commentators reveled in this, loved writing books called An End to Evil, etc., etc., where, again, there was no sense that this could be explained by any of the, the issues that Dibiash raised. This was just pure, outright evil as such. But in looking at what the West did, in our name in it as well, you see, in many cases, alliances with states that were, and still are, known human rights abusers. You see that with respects to Pakistan, with respects to Israel, with respects to Saudi Arabia, in many places around the world, where cultivating an alliance with a particular country made strategic importance, regardless of what they did internally or even external. Additionally, the means that were employed, the bombings and the, the extreme violence that was used, both in terms of the actual military missions themselves, and then one example obviously is the bombing of Fallujah in Iraq. And one thing that um, a colonel in Iraq said at the time was, you know, how are we going to deal with the insurgents and all that? And he said, well, with a heavy dose of fear and violence and a lot of money for projects, I think we can convince these people that we're here to help them. So from the very beginning, there was this, this sense of, you know, we pay for your electricity and your healthcare, but there's also the club. You know, and if anybody steps out of line, in comes the heavy dose of fear and violence. And of course, it's that heavy dose of fear and violence, more so than anything else, I think, that people remember with respect to Iraq and with the war on terror more generally. And of course, it's, it's important to go beyond just Iraq. You know, the recent revelations about the alliance that was cultivated with Gaddafi's Libya, at one stage, that made sense, because again, we could send people we wanted to torture to Libya. And he, he would really squeeze me, you know, that he'd get the, the information he required. And this was all put forward as being imperative, an emergency situation. And yet, in the process of doing that, of course, we, we exposed our own, let's say, fairly selective adherence to human rights and to morality and norms, despite the fact that we claimed to be fighting on behalf of these things. And it wasn't just externally, it also saw the, the Patriot Act in, in America coming in, severely curtailing civil liberties in the United States. Likewise, the Blair government, an ostensibly left-leaning government, tried to bring in, I think it was 40 days detention before you could charge somebody. An extraordinary uh, length of time. You know, every, you know, I'd admit to having shot Kennedy after 40 days of being in, in terrible torture, let's say. And there was a general contempt for law. I think summed up by one thing that George Bush said. He said, with respect to the, the looming invasion of Iraq. I don't care what the international lawyers say. We are going to kick some ass. <laughs> you, could, you could use that, I think, not just the international, but the domestic as well. Nothing counts but our sense of righteousness and what we can do to make the world a better place. And the impact of these policies and the impact of what they've done, I think has, has led to really pr profound implications for democracy. This clearly shatters the idea of democratic exceptionalism. This is something that was looted in the 1990s, that we've got good states, we've got bad states, and we've got the really, really good states, which are the democratic states. And we can't allow democratic states to be subjected to the same laws as the bad guys. 
So we'll have situations like Kosovo where the good states, the democratic states, will do the right thing. Even if it's illegal, you can trust us because we're democratic. We have exceptional rights. And possibly Kosovo, you know, you could make a strong case for that being the right thing to have done. I personally disagree, but you could make a strong case. Iraq, it's far more obvious that this was not about, you know, us having uh, legitimate exceptional rights. This was bald aggression. This was criminality on a grand scale. And that idea of democratic exceptionalism suffered a blow there. Additionally, more troublingly, I suppose, is the idea that we, all, the, all of us sitting here in the room, we have some say in our respective countries, our democratic countries' foreign policy. The notion that was put forward in the 1990s that there was this global civil society that could act as a kind of a, a pressure on states, compelling democratic states to take action when required, to address interstate crises and do the right thing. And if they didn't, we'd all go out in the streets and demand that they, they do it. They would act because we would pressurise them to do so. That proved to be complete nonsense in the end. Patrick Tyler wrote at the time of the demonstrations, prior to the invasion of Iraq, he said, the United States now faces a rival superpower, namely world public opinion. And he said, politicians and leaders cannot ignore it. And yet, of course, they did. Ignored it profoundly. And what does that say again about democracy? What are we meant to make of that? Surely it has profound implications for the idea that we, the people, have some say in our state and how it's run. And possibly worse about all that is that even though this was the largest anti-war demonstration in human history across the world, I think it was February the 15th, uh, 2003, the Australian Prime Minister, the United States President and the British Prime Minister were all re-elected at the next election, despite this massive outpouring of anger that continues to this day. And again, what does that tell us about us? Does it tell us that we don't care about foreign policy? We don't really care about international relations? You know, we can go out into the streets and wave banners, but really when it comes down to it, it's, has my house increased 10% in value in the last year? And in the long term then, I you know, just want to say maybe that there's, there's three, I suppose, questions. The idea that the West was somehow so militarily superior to any other uh, alliance has to be uh, a question by what's happened, particularly in Afghanistan, which has been you know, a bleeding wound since 2003. <coughs> What does that tell us if the most powerful military alliance the world has ever known cannot defeat the Taliban after 10 years? Surely that has profound implications again for the idea that Western military might can solve almost any problem. Secondly, the West's credibility, the lies, the deception that, you know, that, that characterized the war on terror. Again, our soft power, if you want to put it like that. What damage has been done to the, the soft power of the West in the last 10 years? And have people increasingly begun to say, particularly in Africa, if we want to cultivate an alliance with a powerful uh, um, you know, sponsor, should we not look to China, should we not look to Russia instead of the West, the duplicitous uh, West? And as Roland said, this has again huge implications for the whole idea of Western superiority, cultural, democratic, military, economic. All these things are called into question by the manner in which this war was, was prosecuted, this disastrous and illegal war. And what we're left with at the end is a very dispiriting view, I think, of international relations in the last uh, 10 minutes. And we can all kind of go away from today and say, isn't that terrible, it's awful, and I feel sad. Or we can look to maybe think, you know, very clearly about reforming these institutions. And that would be, hopefully, the long-term impact of 9-11. That if we have a similar meeting like this in 10 or 20 years' time, people will be talking about 9-11 led to substantial changes in the international system, substantial changes in the laws governing the use of force and the institutions that regulate the enforcement of international law. And that potentially uh, would, would mean that the legacy, the, the, the negative legacy I've talked about, would be somehow uh, addressed in the future. I'll leave it there.